watched Einstein so closely. They were living on different planets. The war posed a big dilemma for Einstein because in his personal relationships he respected and was even fond of his colleagues, but um, rejected their wholehearted support of the war. He comes across this very publicly hyped and published document called the Manifesto of 93, signed by 93 leading German academics, including the people who brought him to Berlin and the people he most values, Haber, and above all, Max Planck. The Manifesto says Germany had to fight. It was justified and morally acceptable to fight in this war. And this shocked Einstein. In effect, a betrayal. This was the moment when Einstein realized that there were some things about life outside physics that were important enough that he had to actually go out on a limb and take some personal risk to defend. He actually tries to present a counter manifesto of other German academics who say, no, there's something else out there besides national pride, national um, competitiveness, national fury. And four people sign the manifesto goes nowhere, never published, it fails. He becomes a pacifist, he becomes a war resistor. And Einstein was nearly alone. He's isolated, he's being rejected by his colleagues. His marriage is breaking up, he's having a custody battle for his kids. He immerses himself in his science. The isolation has a positive outcome as Einstein looks again at his general relativity theory he refocuses on the mathematical equations. One day, he looked back at the calculation for the bending of light as it goes around the sun, and he suddenly realized his earlier calculation was wrong. What would have been found had Freundlich done the observation was only half the deflection that's there, half the bending of the sunlight. It would have discredited Einstein's theory. It is an embarrassing but serendipitous discovery. For three years, Einstein has been urging astronomers to photograph an eclipse, which would prove an equation that he now believes to be wrong. Einstein has always considered the failed eclipse expeditions to be setbacks. In fact, they may have saved his career. The war raging all around him, the physicist retreats to his study. He had a little apartment, and most of his thinking was done in his study. Sometimes he can't quite visualize the curving of space. And what he does is he takes out his violin. He said that Mozart's music captured the harmonies of the universe. Playing the violin would help him think. Einstein had this prodigious ability to sit and think. It was called Sitzfleisch. People who knew him said he had this remarkable Sitzfleisch where he can concentrate on a problem for hours, for days, even years. In his office are lots of mathematical manuscripts with equations all over. And he's sitting there thinking, walking around, standing deep in thought. He's doing pure mathematics in his mind. Science is done by the seat of your pants. We have leaps of logic. We have years of wandering in the wilderness. We have frustration. We have pulling our hairs out. That is really the power of genius, the force of will to make all the mistakes necessary to get the right answer. It was never a moment of, oh no, I'm not gonna have a theory. That, uh, because of his ego, I don't think it ever occurred to him that he's not gonna have a theory. What matters is you keep your eye on the prize. For Einstein, that prize is the Nobel proceeds of which he has promised to Maleva and his two sons. In 1915, he's asked to present his general theory of relativity at a prestigious forum to the most important German scientists. Einstein accepts, but after eight years of work, his theory still has two major problems. It's completely unproven, and the math appears to be flawed. After nearly a decade of work, Einstein's general theory of relativity is still far from finished. His math is wrong, and without the correct calculation, his theory can't be proven. 
And now, he's scheduled to deliver a paper to the most prestigious scientific gathering in Germany. Prussian Academy, it's a very formal place. It's a place that knows how distinguished it is and how historically significant it is. And these weekly meetings you can sort of see as, as an attempt by, by, you know, at least some of Germany's leading thinkers to act as if the war were not all there was. Einstein is to present his theory of general relativity. The problem for Einstein is he hadn't finished it yet. In the fall of 1915, Einstein was hardly thinking about uh, anything else. He was completely focused on finding the solution to a puzzle that had occupied him for more than eight years. Einstein is trying to come up with these equations that describe how space is curved. And he's working deep into the night. If you look closely, it's really trial and error. You're not seeing a mathematician who just, you know, throws the ideas, you know, perfect formulas onto, onto the paper of the notebook. He cancels everything and says nonsense. These terms disturb. So he's sort of talking to the math. Sometimes he turns the notebook around and then he, you know, throws it away with disgust. It can be a real blow when an idea you've been working on doesn't work out this gut-wrenching feeling. Since discovering his math error, Einstein believes he is making real progress. His equations are nearly complete. He accepts an invitation to speak at Göttingen University, essentially a dress rehearsal for the Prussian Academy. Einstein is up at the board writing his equations and trying to describe his problem. In the audience is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, David Hilbert. Hilbert sits there and listens very carefully to Einstein. He thinks, I can solve the problem. I can do it better than Einstein. There's always this worry that you might get scooped. You become a little bit paranoid, or sometimes a lot paranoid. There's always this feeling I have when I, when I have a good idea, which is that, well, if I've had this good idea, that probably means that someone else is going to have or has had this good idea, too. Einstein goes back to Berlin, and Hilbert goes into his own office. And Hilbert sits there and thinks and tries to race Einstein to the big prize of general relativity. He was one of the greatest mathematicians of his time. A controversy between the two giants, a giant of physics and a giant of mathematics. Hilbert, the nasty guy here who thinks he can beat Einstein, starts working. Hilbert thought that physics was much too important to be left to the physicists, or the mathematicians should take care of it. Stakes are very high here. All or nothing to unlock the secret of light, to unlock the secret of gravity. Nobody can ever say that Einstein is not a fantastic mathematician, because at that moment, the problem is distilled into pure mathematics. Several times, Einstein thought he had it. When he submitted one of the versions to the Prussian Academy, he wrote his son in Switzerland, you know, you will later understand that this was a great day that changed history, uh, and your father was, you know, producing it. But it turned out, again, to be a, an erroneous version. He had to change it a week later once more. He had tried many alleys before, and they turned out to be dead ends. How long do you wait developing this idea writing the paper, working out all the consequences before publishing it. Einstein had to be really afraid that Hilbert would uh, actually take over the whole game and publish the final equations of general relativity before him. All of a sudden, he discovered that several pointers all seemed to point in the same direction. Einstein remembered that he had given up a very radical solution that he had uh, stumbled upon already in 1912 and that he had then discarded because it looked just physically too unfamiliar, too unacceptable. But now, after he had tried out all these other alternatives, he was ready to return exactly to that equation, back to an equation that he had earlier considered and then discarded three years before you realize that you've been wrong in a real flash of inspiration because you realized what you should be doing. You know, he had it all in his drawer. 
And that's, of course, then a glorious moment. There it was, the equation that he had discarded, and uh, now it was it looked much more promising, much more useful than it had in the winter of 1912. It isn't always a dark time when you realize that you're wrong. Sometimes it's a wonderful time. The excitement for Einstein comes with the realization that the answer for his new theory can be found in an old astronomical riddle. Einstein began to look at a mystery that had puzzled astronomers for generations. According to Isaac Newton, the planet Mercury should be going around the sun like this. But it was known for quite a while that the orbit of Mercury deviates from Newton's laws of motion. It tilts a little bit. So the orbit, instead of going like this, begins to tilt. And it begins to make a pattern like the petals of a flower. Einstein realizes his thoughts on gravity might explain Mercury's orbit in ways the Newton's law could not. Was Newton wrong? Einstein says, maybe it's my theory of gravity. Is this simple enough to explain all the experimental data? He calculated painfully the orbit of Mercury, and there was a near perfect match. His equations on a notepad matched the motion of heavenly bodies in outer space. He has heart palpitations, and he suddenly realized, oh my god, the theory is correct. And his, he was so filled with joy that he couldn't make his brain focus. And for Einstein, that's a big deal. He finally gets the equations right, just as David Hilbert does. There's a little bit of a dispute. Who got the equations first? There's a lot of rancor at that moment. Einstein gets so hurt. Hilbert was very gracious. He says, it's Einstein's theory. Einstein deserves the credit. He's victorious. The theory is Einstein's. On November 25th, 1915, a momentarily triumphant Albert Einstein holds in his hands what he believes is the final equation for the general theory of relativity, his theory of gravity just in time for his presentation at the Prussian Academy. He goes to the Academy and he speaks. Not for very long, it's a short paper. With that, you have the general theory of relativity, which describes how space and time tell matter and energy where to go. Matter and energy tell space and time how to look utterly different view of what our universe is like. Who knows how much applause he got, nobody does. Everyone suddenly found themselves confronted with the idea that this strange German Jew had overthrown Newton's ideas of gravity. What exactly this meant now, no one was quite sure. There's still no physical proof of it. No one understood Einstein. Einstein believes he has finally got his theory right, but he knows that it won't be accepted until he can prove it. And he can't prove it without photographs of a total solar eclipse. For that, Einstein will have to wait again. Einstein publishes his completed general theory of relativity in 1916 with the corrected mathematical equation but there is still much work to be done. He needs photographs of a rare solar eclipse to prove the theory's accuracy. But in war-ravaged Berlin, now under blockade by the British, even the basic necessities of life are hard to come by. Surrounding him, Berlin was an impoverished city, and the hunger grew so bad that there were hunger riots. In the middle of a harsh winter, Einstein's intense productivity comes to a sudden halt. The reason he stops is he's exhausted and he's sick. Bad stomach problems. He's really, really, really sick. He writes, I don't eat. I haven't been able to sleep. And he succumbs to a physical and a mental breakdown. Einstein retreats to a small apartment in Berlin. His cousin Elsa becomes his nurse and savior. Elsa keeps cooking for him, bringing him food, eventually having Einstein move in with her. While Einstein's health is in Elsa's hands, the fate of his theory lies with astronomers. One of them who will play an important role is at Cambridge University in England. 
Arthur Eddington is a scientist, but also a religious man, who attends this small Quaker meeting house just across the street from the university. Sitting in the back row at this Quaker meeting, full of people sitting quietly, 